Uh, so my name's Jeff. Uh, my background is in neuroscience, so I used to study stuff like visual attention, using techniques like M MRI, eye tracking, stuff like that. Uh, but at Riot Games, I'm currently a lead game designer. Uh, with me is Carl Kuo. Carl Kuo has had over 10 years of experience as a producer, and he's done games such as Plants vs. Zombies, as many of you guys know, uh, content on League of Legends, like Spectator Mode, Replays right now, and he is the producer of the player behavior team at Riot Games. Uh, so today we'll talk a little bit about the science behind player behavior uh, in online games and some of the experiments we've been doing online and some of the lessons that we've been picking up in the past year. So some of this data we've never presented outside of Riot Games, uh, so we're really excited to see what's the feedback from you guys. For those of you not familiar with Riot Games, we're a game studio and publisher located in Santa Monica. Uh, our first game is League of Legends. We're really focused on the player experience first, and what that means is we're all hardcore gamers, and we literally, video games are a part of our lives. Our mission statement at the company is we aspire to be the most player-focused game company in the world. To give you a sense of what League of Legends is, it's a game that launched in 2009. It's a team-oriented, competitive, hardcore game, usually played 5v5 or 3v3. And we have over 100 champions in the game. These are characters that you can choose in any given game, kind of like superheroes in the game. And the game is set in a modern fantasy world. There we go. So a, a few, a few high-level stats. Every month, over 30 million players log in and play League of Legends. We see a lot of daily active players as well, and we record over a billion play hours monthly. To give you context on this data point, YouTube, for example, they record over four billion hours monthly. So a lot of our players are really hardcore, and they play the game with intensity. They play the game a lot every single day. And at peak time during the day, we have over 5 million players logging in at the same time playing League of Legends. <coughs> On the player behavior team, we have a really simple mission statement. We want League of Legends to be the most competitive, nope. most sportsmanlike, <laughs> community and core competitive games. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why he's the producer. That is also why I'm the producer. But some of you might be wondering, why do we have a player behavior team at Riot Games? Why do we need PhDs and statisticians and researchers? Why do we, why do we need modelers? The reason is because we've, we've all played online games and we've all experienced behavior that's less than polite. Uh, a lot of psychologists, sociologists, they've tried to come up with theories on why behavior online is worse than real life. But our favorite representation of this is a comic by our gamers, fellow gamers at Penny Arcade. So I see a couple smiles. Most of you have seen this particular comic. <laughs> but the insight we draw from this is that people, players, are not innately toxic. Right? It's the behavior that can become toxic. And it might be because there's a lack of consequences, a lack of accountability, or because they're anonymous online. These are reasons that could make your behavior more toxic. But why do we keep using this word toxic? Why, why is bad behavior toxic? So let's do a thought exercise. I'm gonna pull 10 random players, and in real life, they're all good people, right? In their own given context, they all come from different backgrounds. And they play a game together. But one player gets pissed off. So a teammate does a mistake, maybe costs his team the entire game, and he rages at that person. He verbally abuses the person, harasses him after the game, and now there's two people in this game that are upset. But actually, just observing that one incident, multiple people are actually frustrated now. They now have a negative experience from this incident. So now we have four players in the game that are upset, and one of these players might play one more game afterwards, but he's starting the game already upset. So the cycle continues, and toxicity spreads, and now many games seem toxic, but the stem of the source might be just that original player having a bad day and raging out because of one incident. So really early on, we had to ask each other a question. If we simply ban all the toxic players from the society or from the game, do we solve the player behavior problem? And the simple answer is no. <laughs> Everybody's like, I knew it. <laughs> so let's take a look at some data that might suggest that simply banning toxic players is not the right solution. So in the game of League of Legends, you can report or honor players on a variety of dimensions. So if you had a great experience with a player, you can honor them for being friendly or helpful. If you had a negative experience, you can report them for stuff like verbal abuse or negative attitude. By aggregating all these metrics together, we can basically segment our population to four distinct buckets. And it looks something like this. 
What you quickly see here is that 1% of our players are qualified as toxic. What that means is they get reported often by many players in nearly every game they play. And they are banned by our player behavior systems. But what's more important is that over 92% of our players are neutral or positive. Let's take a look at a second metric. Let's look at all the toxicity in the system and how much of it stems from these four buckets. We actually thought it would look something like this. Even though it's a small population that is toxic, they're responsible for the whole majority of toxicity in our system. But that isn't the case. It actually looks something like this. So even though the toxic population represents 1% of the active player base, they only represent 5% of the toxicity in the system. The majority of toxicity still stems from the neutral and positive players in our game. And we're going back to it, it might just be because these players are having bad days. Right? They're not innately toxic. But if you have a bad day at work or a bad day at school, maybe somebody yelled at you on the way home, and you want to play League of Legends, and you play a terrible game, and somebody's raging at you there as well, and you just flip. You flip the tables, you rage back at that person, but you might not do that for another 100 games. So on the player behavior team, we, are, we do have a unique opportunity to shape online behavior. And why do I mean that? Well, we record over 20 million sets of data a day. So what does that mean? So let's break apart my own personal account in League of Legends and show you some stats from that account. So as Justin mentioned, I'm light online, and we have game stats on me. So how many total games have I ever played in League of Legends? How many champions have I played in the game? Uh, what were my favorite champions? And apparently I like Gangplank, who's a pirate. Uh, we have total wins, total losses. We can also get higher resolution. We can get how many games I played today or yesterday or how many losses did I have yesterday? We also have social stats. So how many friends do I have online? How many new friends did I make? How many people did I honor today or yesterday? We also have secondary network stats. For example, if I honored these players, how many people did they honor? But beyond raw stats, we can also quantify experiences. For example, what are the correlations in all the games where I report at least one player for verbal abuse? Or is there anything in common for all the games that I honored three people? We even have data that extends beyond the game. For some countries, we even have their SES, their education scores, their age, even their gender. Really and, huh? Uh, Socioeconomic status. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we can correlate any of these data with in-game data as well. So we have a team. And we have this database that is seemingly infinite in potential. But how do we tackle a problem as vague and complex as toxic player behavior online? And that's, what, and that's really what we were faced with when we kicked off the player behavior, uh, no worries, uh, player behavior initiative is, you know, we have all this research and data and we know that we want to make a difference. But how do you break apart this problem? How do you start to, to understand how we can approach this and, and really pull it apart. And we got into a room, the entire group, and we sort of said, well, what do we want to start to accomplish? What are the things that we think we could work on? You know, we have the tribunal, but what, what are other systems that we could do? And we started brainstorming and discussing, and we started to see themes really popping out. And those themes became our strategies and, and really the foundation of how we approach the player behavior uh, uh, initiative. And I'll take you through them. So our first pillar is that we want to shield players from the impact of toxic behaviors. This is really important because we recognize that the likelihood of us making a perfect system that stops all toxicity forever and ever is pretty small. Um, and so we need to be able to understand that when toxic events happen, because they will eventually, uh, how we can stop the impact from being so heavy to our, to our players and how we can stop that ripple effect that Jeff was talking about earlier. Our second core pillar is that we want to reform or remove toxic players. And this, that word choice and word order is really important, so I want to call attention to it. We want to reform first and remove second. In many communities, we jump right to the removal part. We, we see bans as a way to solve the, the player behavior problem um, in, in most online communities. And what we found that for our game, because we are a free online game, it's very easy to re-enter the system with a new account. You just come right back. So what we really want to focus on is on how do we reform those players who are exhibiting toxic behavior into not exhibiting that anymore and being more neutral players or, or good players. Our third pillar is we want to create a culture of sportsmanship. We recognize that this is not a, a, a problem that we're going to solve on our own, right? We really need to involve the community. 
And so the way we approach that is what we want to do is work with our community, do, do have discussions with them, and create a real strong culture within that community that expects sportsmanlike behavior. And then as we address this player behavior problem, you're getting reinforcement not just from rag games and light and status quo in the forums, but also from your peers, the guys you play with in-game, who you interact with every day. Our fourth pillar is reinforce positive behaviors. We really want to make sure that even as we're trying to show how not to be bad, how not to be toxic in the game, we're also spotlighting really positive behaviors that the community sees as great examples so that we can build role models and create aspirational paths for players to follow who, who may previously have just known how not to be good or not to be bad. They now know how to be good. And then finally, our fifth pillar is we want to create better match chemistry. You know, through, through personal experience as well as looking at the data behind the game, we recognize that when you do a, what's called an in-house game in, our, in, in, the, in League of Legends, but where you have 10 friends all playing the game together, those tend to be the most positive games. You're all having fun, you're familiar with each other, there's a high degree of trust between all the players on each team. Um, and what we want to do is find a way to make every game that you potentially play, whether it's with strangers or with friends, feel like that experience where you know and have confidence with the teammates you have and have a really, really great experience. And what we wanted, so this pillar is really about creating that situation and finding ways to improve uh, uh, trust within the game as, as early as champ select. What I want to do and what the bulk of this presentation will be um, is we want to kind of take the data that Jeff talked about and the strategies that I just talked about and really apply them and show how it plays out for a given feature within the player mm -hmm. behavior team. Um, and the, the, the feature that we have liked. Um, the feature that we're going to talk about is the Tribunal, which is one of our oldest and others. No, no, no. Lecture, interrogation. We're going to talk about the Tribunal, which is one of our oldest features and has a really rich history that we can uh, show a lot, of, a lot of how this has gone on. We start out almost every feature we do with a very simple hypothesis, and the Tribunals was this that we want to engage, that we believe that engaging our communities to manage their own behavior can be an effective approach to fighting toxicity. Um, and really this lines up with our core pillar of wanting to reform or remove toxic players. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with what the tribunal looks like or if you've never interacted with it, this, this is a screen from the tribunal. Um, what you can see is that we're presenting back to the community. Yeah, it, it, there's some pretty great chat there. Um, we're presenting back to the community information about toxic events that have happened in the game. So in, in this particular case, you can see that the behavior, ex you can see the number of times this uh, player was reported in a number of games, comments about the reports, so details if, if they were shared, um, as well as all the chat that happened in the game. And actually, if, if we had scrolled down farther, you would be able to see game states like what champions were played, what the KDAs were, what items were built, that sort of thing. And what our community can do is take a look through this, review this, and say, hey, you know, I think this, this behavior is actually totally acceptable within our game, so we should pardon this case. Or this behavior is totally unacceptable for this community, we should punish this case. This is, not, this is a approach that we've taken, that other people have taken. Fold it, it as an example, is a University of Washington um, project that engages the community to solve protein fold, folding problems. And what we found is that, in, in both cases, engaging the community in especially difficult problems that are hard for computers or algorithms to deal with is a really, really effective way to solve the problem, um, as well as a really great way to engage everyone in the understanding what the problem set is and bought, bought into the approach. To date, the tribunal we, we've considered is fairly, very successful. Um, we've logged 105 million votes. And then we've also reformed over 280,000 players. When I say reform, what I mean is people who have gone through the tribunal been punished, but are, as of today, currently in positive standing. And, and we've also done a lot of analysis around who votes in the tribunal. And specifically, we've looked, uh, one of the stats we've looked at is percentage of the games that they participate in that result in a report. And we looked at three populations. The first population is toxic players, who look a little bit like this. Then we have the people who vote in the tribunal, and then just a random sampling of players across the board. 
And what you can see is the tribunal judges have about a 20% delta from the toxic players, but only 3% from the random sampling. Our conclusions from this is that there aren't toxic players going in and trying to mess with the tribunal. For, for the most part, the judges are pretty close to your everyday player who trend a little bit more positive. And this is really great because it shows that they're pretty representative of the community, but just going down that path and trying to make a difference in the community around them. To sort of evaluate the accuracy of the tribunal, uh, we pulled some cases and, and we're gonna show them to you here. And this sort of demonstrates how our players are able to pretty quickly pick up on what's going on and, and have a high degree of accuracy. Uh, so I encourage you to, to read all the fun chat. Uh, so this was an example that was flagged as moderate toxicity and qualified for an email warning. And as you can see, players pretty quickly picked up that our friend Master Yi here uh, was using some homophobic language, uh, a mom joke. You know, nothing too bad, but definitely some toxicity. A more severe case is the SIGs which was flagged for severe toxicity and qualified for a very long time ban. And you can see that there are violence threats, he's much more aggressive, he's, he's spamming the chat a lot, um, and, and that was flagged by our players. Finally, our, our players are also really good at noticing when things are not quite right, and, and there are cases on the other side. For example, this guy was pardoned and received no punishment because they, they saw that, yeah, some guy reported him for trash talking, but nothing was said in game. So probably, that's probably acceptable within the community, uh, and so the community uh, pardoned him. What we did is we also took a lot of cases and saw how players voted, them, voted on them, and then took those same cases and put it through our Riot player support to see how closely does our community line up with what our, our internal Riot player support system would flag. And what we found, actually, is that between the two of them, that there's a really high level of agreement between the community and the riders, about 79% agreement. And when we dug into this to sort of understand and really, really dig into this data, we found that the, the reason why the agreement level is not higher is that our internal player support judges tend to be a little bit more strict and, and will punish uh, uh, more offenses. So even though the system is even though the system is pretty accurate, we haven't had a perfect history here. We've learned a lot from our past mistakes. And I'll give you one key example. So over a year ago, we used to ban players with a really vague email message in a client pop-up. The really good thing here is it tells players when they'd be banned until, but they have no idea why. But we know from psychology that speed and clarity of feedback, these play critical roles in shaping behavior. So this leads us to the next feature in the tribunal that we call reform cards. So again, we started with a simple hypothesis, and we want to take a pretty big risk with this one. We want to show players exactly why they were banned, and we hope they would improve reform rates. So what does a reform card look like? It looks very similar to a tribunal case, but at the top center, you can see there's the actual decision, there's the community agreement, and there's the eventual punishment. But we send these cards to every single player banned by the tribunal. So let's take a look at some data from this experiment. What I'm going to show you is data from last year when we were still sending vague email messages and client messages. And this is the percentage change in reports received after they received their warnings or their other punishments. So on average, after they got a warning, they did improve their behavior. They got fewer reports after their warning and their vague email. But for three day, seven day, and 14 day bans, they got worse. So players came back to the game angry and frustrated. They had no idea why they were being banned and they got banned even quicker after, the, after their first ban. But after we launched reform cards, we saw sharp improvements in every category of punishment. And this makes sense. Players now knew what was okay or not okay in League of Legends, and even if they didn't agree with that, they knew that that was inappropriate and it could get them banned. Here we made a conscious, a conscious decision to host all of our reform cards online. So we actually sent URLs to every single player that they could share with their friends or their community. So as you can imagine, when we first launched this feature, we were really scared about the forum posts that would go up. And this is the first thread that went up after the feature went live. Permaban because my team sucked and I called them fags. Now, we saw that this player had posted his reform card and he posted paragraphs about how Riot sucks, about how Tribunal's broken, about how his ban's simply unfair. And we were kind of concerned, how would players respond to this? What would the responses be like? We were shocked in the best way possible. Here's the first response in that thread. <laughs> and here's some more from that exact form thread. 
But the key here is that our own community was speaking up and they were loud and clear. This behavior was not okay in online games. The final experiment I'll talk about today is the justice review. So to give you a little bit of context, when we first launched the tribunal, we actually gave currency when people completed cases. So there was a small perception that grew over time that players didn't really care about justice. They didn't care about the cases or reviewing them accurately. All they cared about was currency. So we had to design an experiment uh, around the motivations of our players. And although recent, fa uh, recent models of motivation are quite complicated, we're gonna focus on two really simple elements of this. We're gonna focus on extrinsic motivation, which is simply going to tribunal and getting some extra currency. And compare that against intrinsic mo motivation, which is I just wanna do good for the community and contribute to the greater good. To do this, we created a feature called Justice Reviews. It's a simple profile page. You log in and you see some stats about your contributions to the community and to the tribunal. You can see there's total cases completed, your accuracy, some ratings, your longest streak. We added a fun stat in there, toxic days prevented, but quite a few players also enjoy players permaband. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at some data from this particular experiment. So this was a three-phase experiment. First, we collected 30 days of data when we were still giving currency for completed cases. So there's our baseline. And we're looking at the daily number of judges that logged into the system. For 30 days, we then removed the reward. So no more currency when you complete a case correctly. We lost about 10% of our players when we did this. But we saw a huge increase when we introduced justice reviews, or almost 100% increase. We can also take a look at a second statistic. So the average number of completed cases when you do log into the tribunal. So again, a 30-day baseline before we removed currency. We saw an increase, actually, in number of completed cases when we re removed currency from the system. So the hypothesis here is that the players that were going to the system and just doing it for currency, they left when that reward was gone. But those players completed fewer cases on average than the rest of the judges anyways, so this average went up. And then we saw a second increase when we introduced justice reviews. So a few takeaways from all the tribunal experiments. A vast majority of the gaming community do find toxic behavior disgusting. One of the coolest insights we saw was that if you look at a word like fag or the C word or the N word online in a tribunal card, those are the most highly punished words in the entire system. Providing tools like the tribunal is how we change this online culture. Two, by showing toxic players reform, reform cards and peer feedback, these players changed. And this is really critical because this is no longer about Riot Games versus players. This is players talking to their own peers and them saying that this behavior is not okay. And finally, highlighting personal contributions to the community and to the tribunal was far more engaging to our community judges than the extrinsic currency. So we're pretty happy with the results we've seen so far and we've learned a lot from these experiments. And that pretty much takes us up to, whoa, I'm very loud. Uh, that pretty much takes us up to current day tribunal and sort of where we're at. Um, I wanna take a, a few minutes and just kind of go over what does our future hold? What are we looking at next with the player behavior team and our features? Uh, one of the weaknesses that we've noticed with the tribunal is that the speed of feedback is not very fast, right? Like the turnaround time tends to be a few days, maybe a week or two. Um, and again, we know that having faster feedback is better. So we're developing a, a feature that we call behavior alerts. And what this is is really an add-on feature that works in conjunction with the tribunal. But it can detect spikes in toxicity as they happen and can intervene to those players and say, hey, hey, dude, like it seems like you're raging a lot right now. Maybe you want to chill out. Maybe you want to relax. And there's not really any punishment involved. It's more of just a quick intervention, a quick feedback point to say, hey, your toxicity is spiking that might not be so great for you in the long term, so uh, yeah. Um, the second feature is what we call the reform system. Some of you, if you follow us on the forums and follow our experiments online, um, you may have seen restricted chat actually just go to the live servers with the, the most recent patch. Uh, this is the first step towards the reform system. The idea here is, I mentioned before that in a free online community, it's very easy to create a new account and come back in, and so banning is not a very strong punishment. Um, and so what we actually want to do is remove banning from our toolkit of, uh, or not from our toolkit, but remove banning from what we do to players as part of reforming them. And instead, use things like restricted chat to slowly take away portions of their experience, but still have them be able to work through a, a, a 
punishment cycle that helps teach them and reform them towards neutral behavior. Um, and restricted chat is really the first one of these. And the idea there is uh, initially when you're banned, we'll put a restriction on your account where you only have a certain number of messages to say inside the game, which means that if you want to burn your messages for raging and fl inflaming other players, there's only so many of those that you can spend. And you have to make the conscious decision to give up being helpful to your team and calling MIAs and giving game information in order to spend it on raging instead. The, uh, we are, we're also building a lot more tools to understand the world around us and to gather more data. Um, one of the things that I wanted to highlight here is what we call the microfeedback tool. And what this allows us to do is really target specific players on, on a bunch of different spectrums and really get in the moment feedback on almost any topic that we want. Um, a recent example of this is that we asked, we saw a bunch of threads on the forums and direct information from our players saying, hey, you know, we there's these ranked borders that we got from being a player in season two. And we actually kind of don't like having them because we feel like we're getting bullied when we have these games. People are saying, oh, that guy has a silver border in a gold game and that's no good. Um, and we're, we were concerned by this, right? We want our rewards to be awesome for our players. And so we really wanted to dig deep into this. And so we actually sent out the survey to uh, a bunch of our players and said, hey, you know, evaluate, tell us your level of agreement with the following statement. I like that ranked players received loading screen borders in season two. Players were presented with this question immediately after playing a game. And so they were in the moment, they had just potentially experienced this. Um, and we got immediate feedback from our players um, very, very quickly. Within a day, we had 60,000 responses that said, you know, actually people kind of agree that they really like this rank lo border loading screen. And so while there are definitely outliers and people who feel this way as expressed on the forums, it's not the overall sentiment of our population. And so these things are not as, to as toxic as those forum threads are, are making them out to be. And that's kind of it. So th those are some stuff that we're, we're working on in the future that we're, we're happy to share with you guys. We haven't talked a lot about them before. Um, and now I believe we're gonna do some Q&A, so that'll be fun. <laughs> and Jeffrey is going to tape things. Um, so w one thing that I want to do just again to, th first of all, this was fabulous and really neat to see. Um, you know, I, I, so I am a League of Legends player you know, from the beta. Um, and so you know, in addition to being a, you know, a bad one as well, but at least one who's played for a long time. Um, and, uh, and so it's been fun for me to sort of watch these things unfold and to, and to see some of the really careful thought that's gone into um, to developing different pieces. I wanna make sure too that, I mean, one of the things I'm gonna challenge you to do in a minute is help us think more broadly. I've been thinking during this talk of this recent study that came um, out of the George Mason University Center, which got quite a bit of, report, of, of press. I don't know if people saw this, this study about uh, toxicity um, in comments and people's reactions to um, writing. Um, so what they did was they posted a kind of research report and a discussion on it and they had two and, and they randomly assigned people to two conditions in one condition um, they there were a bunch of comments about the research report um, that were basically polite and civil um, that, that agreed or disagreed with the report and then a bunch of comments about the research report um, that were not civil um, that were that were inappropriate and what they found was when people read um, the research report with the toxic comments below um, it magnified whatever their opinions were um, so so um, people who thought generally they agreed with the research report was felt more strongly that they agree with the research report. People who um, disagree with the research report disagreed more strongly. So there's basically a way that like public perception of scientific research or other kinds of things as it's as it's presented in the press, um, which has a tremendous impact, you know, on all kinds of civic dilemmas in our society, can be infected by it can be affected by the toxic behavior um, of people in in online forums. And so I think a bunch of the things that you're talking about, you know, obviously are about like making people play nice with each other in games, but also have a lot of resonance for um, for sort of broader institutions in our society. So let me let me let me take the first two questions, and then um, I'll let you I'll, I'll let the audience uh, jump in. Um, so the first one is how do you get your one of the things that you talk about is engaging the community around these issues, um, but you also said that your community consists of 32 million people who play every month. Um, how do you how do you wrap your minds around um, engaging a community of people? Because your team how many how many people is on the player behavior team? Uh, I believe 
20 something 20 something like yeah, that okay so how, how does how does the 20 of you think about sort of engaging a community of 32 million people um, and how do you think about that problem how do you think about that community of 32 million people I can take the first crack at it sure. uh, it's not easy <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so a while back when we first launched Tribunal and we had to do a global launch, launched in several territories, uh, this is something that we're still learning actually. So when we launched Tribunal, we had like a war room that we call setup, and we had several of the player behavior team manned at different stations and we had moderators that would collect questions from every community around the world, like China, like Taiwan, and they would feed the questions to a person they would answer, a live team would translate it and direct it back up to the community. So we were doing live Q&A with multiple countries at the same time. That was not easy and, and took several hours of a huge team coordinating across the world. Uh, but we're constantly trying to find out better ways to do this right now. Yeah, and I, what I would say is generally our, the way we approach it is what we want to do is uh, kind of kick off discussions with the community, bring up issues that we're thinking about that the community has brought up recently. We did one around toxicity and champ select. Um, and, and the idea there is really start the discussion and, and moderate it lightly um, and, and present our viewpoint and stuff, but not with an agenda of like, oh, we want to, to we're, this is our approach and I hope you all agree, but more like, hey guys, what do you think about this? Is this, is this like, you guys had this idea and this would be the costs of it, right? And having those discussions, what we found, it tends to spawn more of those discussions within the community, like that one forum thread that we spent a lot of time in and answering questions, spun off a bunch of other community threads that we didn't need to go into because there was healthy discussion happening there. That was the community figuring out how it felt about these things and eventually it boiled up into riot please threads, um, as most things do. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's... Strindemir said it would be due ne done next year. Yeah, yeah like... <laughs> that was three years ago. Soon to him. Um, the, the, the idea there is, like, we... I don't feel like we need to be part of every discussion or, or a, a giant hand in each of those discussions. What's important is getting our community understanding that we're thinking about this problem and then having them discuss it. That's more what I think what I think of as engagement is not, oh, I need to go and have a conversation with every th one of our 32 million players because that would be my life for the next ever. Um, <laughs> But having it be where those discussions can happen within our community, um, and, and, and they're engaged with the problem. Cool. So, so here's my, here's my second question: What if you guys were the heads of the player behavior team for the internet? Um, <laughs> So, so, so what, what if we promoted you? As you're thinking about sort of what you're learning for designing social systems within um, Riot Games, you know, as you guys are looking at YouTube comment forums, as you guys are looking at um, other kinds of interactive spaces online, um, are, are, there, are there things that strike you, uh, you know, the, the, the White House petitioning system, you know, that, that requires a certain, you know, if you get a certain number of people to petition, they'll respond in some kind of way. Um, like, like, are there things that you look at that you say, wow, there are some design principles that we've come up with, um, or some strategies that we've come up with within this space for gaming that seem like they'd have a lot of, re you know, sort of relevance in other places as other people are designing other sorts of public spheres. I think the really interesting thing there is having peers do much of the changing. Uh, so for example, really early on the tribunal, we had a lot of rioters go on the forums and they would say stuff like, hey, this language is bad, or hey, this is racist. And we would try to enact change by just being pillars of the community. But after tribunal launched, after reform cards launched, we got a letter from a, from a boy and he said he was 10 years old. And he writes like, Dr. Light, um, I never knew that any word was really bad and nobody told me I could not say this word online. And he's like, I'm really sorry. Like, I will not say this again. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm sitting there like taking this letter to my team and we're, we're looking at this letter and saying like, really, like nobody told you you couldn't say that word online? Okay. Um, but the fact was his, his own peers, his own friends, his people he plays with are like, hey, this is not okay. And that's when it clicked for him. And that, that's when he changed. And we get letters like these every single week now. Yeah, and I would say, like, for, from kind of the, the broad strategic producery level, I would say that there is absolutely a lot of overlap. I think that the specific strategies that, you, that I would employ as product owner of the internet, which sounds really <laughs> weird, uh, would be different. Like, I, I think that, you know, we, we, we choose very specific things because we are a competitive game and because our aim is sportsmanship. Um, if, our, if our aim was civil discussion, like I think the specific strategies we would employ would be slightly different, but 
along the same lines of the spirit. Like he said, like engaging the community, having that culture of civic discussion rather than a culture of sportsmanship is really, really important. And it's it's really important to not, you know, we, we product owner of the internet will not be able to affect change on his own. It, you have to get everyone involved. Um, and so it, it, it's a lot of the same ideas, um, but it would be a lot more work and I would want a vacation first. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, let's take some questions. I do we. I don't know. I think passing a mic to everyone will be difficult, and we are recording um, and want this to be able to go up later. So I think what I'm going to do is call on you, and then though it'll be pedantic because everyone in the room can hear it, I'll repeat your question so it gets recorded well, um, and then uh, and then go around. So this gentleman right here had the had his hand up. How do you recruit the judges for this system, and who watches the Watchmen? Uh, good question. Uh, so actually, Tribunal is available for any player in the game over level 20. And it used to be level 30 for a long time in the stretch. Uh, but in our research, we saw that the majority of players that self-volunteered and self-selected themselves, they tend to be a really representative example of the community. And there was very little abuse or cheating. So uh, we once did a sweep of all the cheaters that we thought were abusing the system, or maybe they weren't judging cases and were just pressing random buttons. It, it was less than 1% of the population at that given time. Uh, so I guess Riot is the watchers, but we haven't had to intervene in, in the history of the tribunal. Good. Todd, do you want to ask a question? Uh, you get one. <laughs> um, I think what I'm most interested in is how, because I wasn't surprised to hear about the findings that when you took away the IP rewards from the tribunal, that the, the people actually it went up. Because I feel like it's it's not the it's not an economic imperative; it's an investment imperative, right? When people feel that they have an investment in the community, at the same time, as somebody who plays uh, solo queue ranked all the time, um, <laughs> there's there's a certain ephemerality to the experience of law, right? Like you play with your four strangers, and you either win or you lose, and then unless one of them makes such a good impression that you link up with them in a social networking sort of way, or like they go on your friends list and you queue again, you never see those people again. So how, how do your efforts for increasing investment, how, how do you merge those two things, right? Where you want people to have a significant investment in the people they play with, but the people they play with rotate so fast and the experience is so ephemeral. That's great. So how do you, how do you get people um, to have a commitment to improving the, the quality of the people they play with when in the way, the way League of Legends is structured, the people you play with are in a sense random and anonymous and you'll probably never play with them again? I think that a lot of that is, um, well, first of all, we're, we're talking a lot about that problem more and more. It sort of goes to the, the core pillar of uh, we want to create better match chemistry. Um, a lot of that is, is trying to take I don't want to say take away that ephemerality, but sort of reduce the impact that that has on, uh, on how you approach things. Um, we've Anecdotally, you often have the experience of, even in solo rank queue, you have that game where you're not going to friend anyone after the game, but you're like, man, I really enjoyed playing with that Tarek. He was, he was really good at stunning all the guys. Um, and, and we totally won that game because we were super positive and we, we turned it around at the end, even though we were down two inhibitors and, and, and that sort of thing. And it really comes down to, you can sort of see those games coming even at Champ Select because you're like, oh, I, I want to play this role. And the response back is trust building and confidence building because other people are like, okay, cool, well, I'll play this or I'll play that or, hey, what, do you want me to pick a champion for you early because that's a role that you kind of want to pick early or whatever. Um, so building on that and, and really creating that better match chemistry so when you come in, you're just more likely to, to take the people in the game with you a little bit more seriously, even if it's only for a game or two games, um, I think is, is what the problem that we're worrying about now. Um, and then layered on top of that, creating that culture of sportsmanship so that you know that your expectations of your peers are that they will be sportsmen, even if you only see them once in your gaming life. And their expectations of you that you're very aware of as well is that you will also be sportsmanship, sportsmanlike to them. Um, those are the kind of two, two strategies that I look at as how we address that problem. Grace, did you have your hand up for? Secondly, are you ever afraid that you're going to over-regulate the game to the point that it's unbeletable? Because a lot of people come to the internet with this like, oh, I can do anything I want, and that's why it's so attractive. Um, do you ever feel that you're going to over-regulate? 
Good. So two questions there. One is, you know, what's the right balance between punishment and reward in terms of changing player behavior, and what kinds of concerns do you have about overregulation? What concerns do you, especially with the idea that people come to the internet oftentimes with a sense that it's a space for free expression, um, and here there are all these kind of boundaries and regulations on expression. Um, you know, how, how much concern do you have around those kinds of things? Do you want to come up and answer? Let's have <laughs> so, so just as a quick introduction, uh, we're bringing up another colleague of ours, David Pavlis, who is one of our uh, player researchers and uh, helps me out a bunch with sort of our... I always forget, is it qualitative? Both. <laughs> he, he, helps out, he helps me out with the, the datas. <laughs> As, as regards the overregulation uh, question, I would suggest that we're definitely sensitive to imposing too much regulation, but that the context within League of Legends is not entirely the, the sort of free speech context of the internet. Like all the players who are coming here are coming with a particular goal, and that goal isn't necessarily self-expression, it's to play a game and have fun. And if that's their, their primary goal, we want to work towards encouraging that primary goal and removing things that detract from that. Uh, in terms of reward and punishment, I think it comes down to different contexts. We're shifting pretty heavily to focus on encouraging behaviors because as you saw from the presentation of where the toxicity comes from, it's not bad people who are, who are causing the most of this. It's normal people who have bad days or have a bad experience. And what we want there is to figure out ways to stop that from happening. Like you don't want to smack them and be like, hey, yo, chill do that nice thing you did, right? Like that, <laughs> that is way cooler to us than just being a, a big blunt hammer. That was a very Santa Monica based response to, uh, <laughs> to that sort of in the back corner there. You? <laughs> So how, how do you think differently about sort of first order toxicity and second order toxicity? So how do you how do you think differently about people who sort of introduce toxic behavior into a system and then how do you feel or, or how does the system both maybe how do you guys on the I think there's probably two ways to address that. One is how do you all on the player behavior team think about sort of first order toxicity and second order toxicity and then maybe you have some data from the tribunal um, where if there's if, if you've done any kind of research about how the player community in the tribunal responds to those two different kinds of conditions. One of the most common player complaints by the tribunal is, I want to punish somebody else in the case. Or, I want to <laughs> punish somebody who started the argument. Um, or a lot of ban players will come to us and say, well, somebody else was worse than me, so why, why, isn't, why are you banning that person instead? Why are you banning me? Um, but our common stance is something we've been constantly talking to our players about for the past year, is that retaliation is never OK. And the main philosophy there is that we're simply adding fuel to the fire. Instead of being a part of the solution and trying to either blunt the toxicity or shielding others from it, we're now adding fuel to it and getting more people involved. So when I talk to a player and lay it really, really simply, it's if you jump in and you retaliate, you're now creating a negative experience for eight other players in the game. right? So it's not just about you and him having an argument. You're now creating a bad experience for everybody around you. So we're still talking to players about it, and we still see this complaint a lot, but it's going to be an on ongoing discussion. Great. Um, right here. Okay, so what what so it sounds like Valve, which game are you referring to? Hmm? Okay, so Dota 2, we're claiming has a system of sort of taking the the 1% of toxic players and like putting them in the same matchmaking system and just letting them have their own sort of cesspool. Um, <laughs> what's so, your response to that strategy? I'll, I'll talk a little bit to this and I'm sure I think David has some words to say about this. Um, internally, we we call that idea prisoner's island. Uh, and the main concern we have with Prisoner's Island is it's basically a one-way trip, right? When you throw a bunch of toxic players together, they're not going to get better, right? And a, there, a lot of players, when they go to Prisoner's Island, they, they actually lack self-awareness. They don't feel that they're toxic, and they, they feel like they shouldn't be there, right? So they're in Prisoner's Island. They're looking around. They're like, whoa, these guys are all jerks. Like, what am I doing here? Like, I don't deserve to be here. Um, so a lot of players end up making new accounts anyways and shifting their toxicity back to the low levels again and back to our new player base. So for us in our game, Prisoner, Prisoner's Island is not the ideal solution. 
Okay, let me just, oh, we've mentioned levels a few times, and I know there are some people who don't play League of Legends, that, that, it's, a, that it's a free to play game, um, that sort of the full suite of features of the game is open to you when you achieve level 30, which you get to over a period of time, and so it's actually a fair amount of work to build a character, um, and there are rewards that you can earn within the game that are associated with a character, and so when we talk about people recreating accounts, they're basically going back to level one under a new name and starting over, and, so, and since it's, it's um, the game's model is free to play to begin with, and then you purchase sort of in-game items as you go along or in-game items isn't the right word. Um, but uh, so that's sort of an important dynamic here that, you know, just actually just like we would see in lots of other places like, you know, if, if YouTube or the New York Times sort of bans someone from their comment forums, like it's your one email address away from jumping back in, um, especially if you're in a place like MIT where you share, you know, a couple of IP addresses and like, you know, you're <laughs> all, uh, right. And uh, to hit a little bit more on Prisoner's Island, it's a really seductive idea. It's, it's extremely intuitively appealing to people and extremely intuitively appealing to our players. We've actually done some research on sort of what ideas about punishment and about reward appeal to players. But given that it's effectively just a, a time-delayed shift onto eventual ditching and then reintroducing that toxicity at lower levels, even though it, it sounds pretty cool, we're we're not a fan of that. <laughs> have you this actually makes have you ever ever thought about putting some kind of extremely trivial cost to starting a new like like ninety nine cents for an account or um, <laughs> as some kind of way of uh, um, just I, I mean I guess I guess the I guess the appeal of the free account is that there's no barrier to entry for all the people who you want to sort of hook in, um, but uh, and, and I mean I don't think that it's. It, if you if you got an account to level thirty, you know having even a trivial cost is not actually going to be a cost to getting back in, um, and it, it so it sort of serves as just a, a negative experience for a bunch of players that doesn't end up actually helping the problem at all, yeah. um, and so we we haven't really considered that at all. So um, good Little lady right here. Good. So, so League of Legends has a pretty active kind of esports community, and there are players that play at a professional level for pots that are, you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars for winning tournament. I don't think there's any. Have you guys given away a hundred thousand dollars to any team yet? Oh, uh, we gave away a, like hmm? <laughs> we've given away millions of dollars. To but, teams. but, but, like in in one in one tournament, can I win more than a hundred thousand dollars? Yes. Yeah. In, in the world championships. Okay. Again. Good. All right. So up to sort of six figure, uh, six figure for the world championships. Um, so the question there is to what 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 role are you playing in managing those um, professional players and, and their behavior? Sure. So the, the first thing I would say is that, you know, the player behavior team as a construct is mostly a development team that really focuses and worries about this problem. But we also see ourselves as um, ambassadors, probably the wrong word, but sort of mentors and, and leaders of conversation within Riot Games as a whole around player behavior right. issues, right? Like, it's very easy to say, oh, the player behavior team is working about all that. But this is a company-wide goal, um, and everyone at the company plays a part. And we definitely work with the esports uh, uh, guys. Um, we helped talk through sort of their sportsman uh, conduct uh, rules that they have in their their guidelines and all that stuff, um, and we also help them with the sweeps of data around the pro players' accounts and, and the activity they're in. Um, so we're absolutely a part of that conversation. Um, they're 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 the leaders there as far as esports and, and, and following those guidelines, but we're also taking just a, a taking taking a, a stand that you know a lot of other competitive organizations take of you have to be sportsmanlike, and so um, it's something that the entire company worries about. Including esports. So, okay. um, right here. Hi. Um, uh, this is actually like segues right along to my question. Uh, how does the player behavior team at Riot uh, work with the other departments at Riot? Um, or I could see the scenario coming up where um, the design team maybe wants to implement voice chat, for example, um, and you know that would have a huge impact on player behavior. So I'm kind of curious as to how you know, your team works within the whole ride and how decisions are made. So the question is, how does uh, the player behavior team work with other development teams, especially in circumstances um, where developments that might you know, sort of accentuate one area of game play would have a big impact on player behavior in, in, in expected or unexpected ways? Sure, and I, I, I'll take part of that. And I think that you know, specifically to design, Jeff can speak a little bit more. Um, like I said before, you know, the, the player behavior initiative is company-wide. Uh, goal and so a lot of 
a lot of my job actually is, you know, to talk to a lot of other teams, a lot of our other departments, sort of explain a lot of what we just just explained to you, like, hey, here's here's the problem, and here's how we're trying to solve it, and how we're trying to approach it. And, and in many cases, other teams come to us and are like, hey, you know, we're we're doing we we're thinking about doing this thing, right? Like, we're we're thinking about implementing this feature or 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 approaching this this problem. And we're curious. Do you think this has any player behavior impact? We don't feel like it does, but maybe it does. And um, our team, in, in various circumstances, talks to them about like, well, it might affect this or it might affect that. Um, you probably want to look out for this or that. And, and it, actually, we have this research that we happen to do that says that what you're, the problem you're trying to solve is actually this problem over here, not that problem over there. So like, maybe that should guide your approach. And, and, and really, we're sort of like internal consultants in a lot of ways around the, the subtleties of the problems, but everyone is aware that we need to be conscious of that and, and tries to take a very measured approach to uh, anything we add to the game. So for, for game design in particular, we're extremely collaborative. So on the player behavior team, we have three game designers, for example, and we have our hands in almost every single feature that is being made for League of Legends. So as soon as something spins up, as soon as a new idea happens, we're already in that discussion about, hey, what are the player behavior concerns like Carl was mentioning? Good, we can probably take a few more questions. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, you were talking about sort of like extrinsic versus intrinsic motivation earlier, and that reminded me of the honor system. And I came in late, so maybe you talked about it before, I don't know. But um, I'm really curious as to what data you've seen coming out of that, and how effective that's been, given that, as far as I can tell, it is just another extrinsic motivator, given that it just you know, gives you those players. So one of the things that we didn't talk about here is an honor system which allows players to sort of tag other players after at the end of the game with, a, with an honor badge, which if you earn enough of them, um, gets sort of permanently, rep, rep, you get a permanent visual representation of your honor status uh, throughout the game. Um, so maybe you can give us just like the highlights. I think you guys were talking about this at PAX East. A little no. bit. Yeah, it okay, it so. might come up, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the really cool stats we've been seeing is that really early on, uh, about 23% of players that were formerly in the bad demographic, for example, they started really shifting their ways and trying to earn honor. Uh, and a lot of players came to us and said, well, they're, they're just faking it. They're just pretending to be nice. Uh, they're no longer swearing anymore, but they just want to get some points. Uh, right, 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 right. Uh, so we saw that, which was pretty cool. We're still investigating and following those players to see, is, is the change lasting or is it temporary? Uh, another really cool thing that we saw is uh, in the game, as Justin mentioned, you can earn honor badges to display on the loading screen. And it's this little ribbon that shows, you know, are you a great teammate? Are you a great leader? What's really cool is if, you, if we define a good game as a game where no complaints were filed at all, it turns out that if you play with one of these players with the badges, you're highly likely to have one of those games. So what we're finding is that people who do have badges, they are linked to many games that have very, very few complaints and very positive experiences. I mean, yeah, it's fine. You know, as soon as I saw those badges, I was like, "Oh, I want one of those." Um, and, I, and I definitely have the experience of like when you see a loading screen and it's got kind of five of those badges on there, you're psyched. You're like, "Oh, this is like I bet these are going to be nice people who I'm playing with." I can totally imagine that. <laughs> Unless I'm like that guy, but I'm not. But I'm not. I'm I'm totally the guy who like is really trying to be nice and can't always succeed. Um, <laughs> it's it's true. It's true. Ryan, do you want to go ahead and? So. It, it seems like from the, some of the examples that you gave that you know that there can be like a variety of different kinds of toxicity. You know, you have to have racism, misogyny, homophobia, uh, and so in the um, tribunal, do you find that uh, all different types of toxicity are more or less treated equally? And if so, did that just come about spontaneously, or did you have to educate people and try to shape that? And if not, are there efforts that you guys are taking to try to get people to take all different kinds of toxicity seriously? So the question is people um, who are, people can behave in various kinds of toxic ways. And probably we've emphasized a bunch of the toxic behavior around language um, because it's most easily represented in like single slides. Although there is toxic behavior about how you play in the game if you go and you know, intentionally kill yourself or do other kinds of griefing behaviors that we haven't talked about. But for the kinds of sort of um, typed verbal toxicity, which might, you know, d does, does the tribunal judge community respond differently to different kinds of toxicity? Do you instruct them or try to coach them around those different kinds of things? Or have you seen what sort of spontaneously responds? So the only guideline in the tribunal is what we call the summoner's code, right? Some of you may have seen it. It's this ambiguous, pretty vague rule set about how to be sportsmanlike. 
what we found that was really interesting was very early on, tribunal judges looked at offensive language by itself, and that was not punishable to them. So if I'm just like, fuck, I missed a skill shot, or I missed that play, players don't punish for that, and we didn't do any coaching on that. But as soon as you direct that harassment to somebody else or target somebody, then it becomes punishable. And that to us was really interesting, that the community kind of molded that way all, all on their own. And another example that we saw was a lot of gamers might use the, the word rape, for example. So like, I, I beat you really well, or I did a really good job against you, and they would say, I, I raped you. Our, our community judges actually are really against that type of language, even if it's not, you know, even if it's in the sense of a skill-based play. Uh, so again, like we didn't have to coach players on that. That just bubbled up organically. No, I love this idea that like people are basically good. <laughs> like a really like wonderful sense of human behavior. It's like you wouldn't necessarily get in some of the things that you. So it's about it's about getting people in the right context and sort of getting some of that out of it. I think that's one of the more encouraging things about the tribunal is there's a lot of stereotypes about gamers that they are like they swear a lot and are hateful towards women and minorities. That's, I mean, that's not really the case from what we're seeing about the community. It's, the community is expressing its standards, and those standards are the same standards we might hold in this hall here today. Um, so one of the big things is uh, it's really hard to get into League of Legends if you don't have a group of friends to start with, because the toxicity starting right away is just like, I, if I didn't find people to play with, then I would have quit right away. So what are you guys doing to make sure that players kind of stay in the game even though they've had a couple of bad toxic situations? Good. So for new, so so it's a so there's a steep learning curve to play the game. There's a lot of toxicity at sort of the low levels of the game, and for new people coming in. And in fact, if you're new at the game and not very skilled at it, you're like more likely to be a target of that toxicity um, than the standard player. Um, what, what what kinds of strategies are you doing to deal with with you know with, with I guess your it connects your pillar number one, sort of shielding players from toxic behavior, especially at low levels. So we can't speak too much to features on this yet, but um, this is something that I have intense passion for is the onboarding process and connecting players with other players who they're going to have a good time with and who can form a social support network. So while I, I can't talk anything about what we're actually doing, that is something we are super aware of. And, and I would just add that, you know, I think that the reform system that I talked to at the beginning, we recognize that there is a large amount of toxic behavior that ends up ends up getting shifted into early levels just through that process of banning players and them coming back and creating new accounts. And so that's one of the main reasons why we want to put such a big effort towards the reform system is if we stop banning people or, or, or stop making it so people are, are effectively encouraged to create new accounts, um, then, then hopefully that by itself will begin to reduce the toxicity in early levels and then we will continue to worry about the problem in other ways. You know, one, one feature change that you made not long ago was, so there are two teams, um, and, every, and, and there's two kinds of chat rooms, basically, while you're playing. One that um, is open to the five people on the team, and one that's open to 10 people in the game, basically a sort of open chat with your opponents. And one of the things that you did recently was change the default settings and sort of a, like, uh, in the, uh, from the Harvard Law School, I'm required to reference the work of Cass Sustein, um, who uh, talks a lot about the sort of how the default Fault settings is an important part of society, um, but uh, um, how uh, you know how, how much does that kind of decision um, play into you know what, what was some of the thinking behind that decision related to this question? A little bit. So that was actually one of the first experiments we ever tried on the player behavior team. So this was a year ago. We were looking and thinking about the player behavior problem in the space and how large it was currently, and we wanted to do a really really small experiment to see how much of an impact could we make on this. Uh, so it was focused on the first pillar to shield our players from toxicity, and we defaulted this off after the patch. And the reason is because we know from psychology research that people opting out, it, it's much more rare than people opting uh, in. So patch happened, and we found that a majority of players actually still opted into all chat. And I think something in the 70% range, just immediately after, I'm going back into all chat. But what was really cool was the environment completely changed. Uh, so in the four months following the feature, for example, we saw 17% uh, a drop in 17% of offensive language. Uh, we saw a drop, I believe, 12% in verbal abuse. Uh, so there's a really weird hypothesis that we have about this, where if you're a toxic player and you're talking to all chat, we feel like you're trying to get a response out of people. And an intentional choice we made was not to show who was opted into all chat and who was opted out. So to a toxic player, he had no idea if there was an audience or everybody was opted out. So those players just took their energies elsewhere. 
So even though all chat was much more positive than before, we were concerned that were they, were they taking their toxicity somewhere else? Were they spending energy against their own teammates now? And it turns out that didn't happen either. So we didn't see an increase in within, within team toxicity or within team reports. So it's kind of like that behavior just, just went away. Um, so we're still trying to figure out where did that energy go? Did, this, did it simply dissipate? Uh, does making a feature that shields our players also reduce the frequency of a negative behavior? Uh, we're still answering those questions. That's great. Maybe we have time for one more question. So you, you mentioned this very briefly, but you, uh, about trying to um, have more immediate feedback about your bad behavior potentially. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, is it the case that when you are reported, you were immediately told that you've been reported? Because, and like, what do you, if it's, that's not the case, then what do you think the result of making that happen would be? Would it just make people rage more because they felt unjustly done by it? Or? So the question is, um, thinking about this time lag between bad behavior, um, having a decision to punish someone, or, or maybe you're, are you talking about punishing someone or just having them be reported? Okay, so the initial act of you've done something wrong, you know, what's the time lag between finding out that you've been reported um, and uh, being reported and finding out that you've been reported and what's your thinking about potentially closing that time or how you think about that time lag? Sure, I can talk about this a little bit. Um, the general, right now in the game, you are not notified when you are reported. The first notification you'll get of being reported is if you go to tribunal and are found guilty um, and you will get your email warning. Um, that's that's kind of your first notification that you were being reported all along. Um, that is a fairly intentional choice up to this point. Um, there is an is incidental rate of reports that everyone is sort of subject to, right? Like I have, uh, my account is considered in very positive standing and I still have a collection of fun reports of, oh, he didn't know how to play Elise, so I reported him, right? Um, and so we, we need to be sensitive to that because there are lots of very, very good or neutral players who if you're said, hey, by the way, you're reported. Um, we see this a lot on threads in the forum when we talk, when people are talking about how, like, they, oh, I was banned and I'm so upset and you know Jeff will come on and post like, yeah, you were kind of reported 160 times in <laughs> 10 games. We're not even sure how that's mathematically possible, but you accomplished it. Um, you'll see a lot of players jump onto that thread and be like, oh, tell me how many times I'm reported. I'm so worried. Am I, I feel like I'm going toxic and, and you look up a few of those accounts and it's like, you've never been reported in the lifetime of your account, which is two years long. Um, and so, there's a great deal of anxiety that comes with that, especially for good initial players. And because people are reported occasionally, um, and that's not a big deal, um, we don't want to be too explicit about it. Behavior alerts is kind of our first foray into really giving that, that faster feedback of, hey, dude, you've been reported recently. And it's much more about you've had a string of toxic reports in a row, and your toxicity levels are climbing rapidly, and we're kind of like keeping an eye on that. Um, less so than, hey, some dude reported you last game because he didn't like your name. you know. So it, it, we have to be careful with that because we don't want to create really uh, uh, negative experiences for good and neutral players, um, but we do want to increase the speed of that feedback. So. Well, great. Um, well, I want to um, uh, thank all of you for joining us today. I really want to thank the Riot team for coming out here and spending a bunch of time with us. You know, we, we increasingly live in a world in which, um, in which private companies own public spaces, um, and it's incredibly important for us to be able to have conversations about what's happening in those privately owned public spaces. And so for you guys to come out here and sort of role model um, the work that you're doing to you know, make those public spaces as rich and welcoming and civil as possible, um, I think is just really, really admirable and, and really exemplary. So I really appreciate that. Um, and. Uh, you know, and I, I hope that all of us, you know, all of us in one way or another are participants and managers in different kinds of communities, and I hope that we can think about how we can take some of these design principles and some of these ideas and experiments um, and, and things that are working and continue to share them, because um, I think, uh, you know, this goal of increasing civility in, in, in a society that's being rapidly transformed by online tools, um, whether it's in our games, whether it's in our um, public discourse, whether it's in our political discourse, um, you know, these are real issues that, that, that affect all of our lives and the, and the health and sustenance of our democracy. In, in different kinds of ways. I mean, it's kind of amazing to think that like the 10-year-old boy that um, Jeff talks to, like some of his fundamental ideas about the judicial system are gonna be shaped by the tribunal that he's playing with in League of Legends. He's, I mean, he's much more likely to encounter that judicial system than um, some of the other judicial systems that exist in the world. Um, so if we can give our, um, <laughs> so if we can give our three panelists a, a big round of applause for. 
Um, I think this is going to be made, the slides and the video will be made available. And if you guys are, you should definitely, if you're interested in getting that, follow the Game Lab and get on their Twitter and Facebook feeds and, and check their email list. Um, but thank you all for coming and uh, have a wonderful evening.